dreams have gone Gone but not forgotten still Gone, gone, gone In the morning light as in a dream With tears in both our eyes We looked upon the face of love We'd wondered all our lives But would it have been better to have no dreams at all I loved you then I've loved you now I've loved you most of all they say we learn the hard way if we learn at all I lost you then I'd lost again I fear for once and all Sometimes things just happen Sometimes things unfold Things sometimes forgotten Things I've left untold And now I'm here without you I can't undo my wrong I'm here within my silence Alone within this song Thank you. What if? What if the world stopped spinning? If it just stood still on its axis and refused to move? If at every latitude and longitude, the sun and the moon stayed still? What if somewhere it is always sunrise and somewhere else the sun is always setting? What if some live forever in total darkness and others in unrelenting light? What if the earth just took a stand and said, I will not turn once more, not one degree, not even the hundredth of a degree, until you learn to love me? What if the earth were to shout to us, I have done all I will do for you. I will not provide succulent morsels for your wasteful tongues after you rape me with violence and pollution. What if she told us that she was finished with the struggle, that it just was not worth it anymore? What if she screamed in anger and in pain, I have no more tears to shed for you. 
you have hurt me more than I am willing to endure. You come to me for everything you need, but you give nothing in return. What if she said, in a voice full of despair, it is too hard to sustain life when you choose to kill and maim each other as a way to solve problems? I cannot keep spinning. I will no longer enable you to destroy us both. I have given all I have to give. It is your turn now. What if in the bright light of the unturning world, we could never stop seeing all that we have taken from her if we were forced to stare at desolation? What if in the perpetual darkness, we could never again see the beauty of a flower, a tree, a mountain, waves breaking on the sand, what if some lived in the glory of an eternal dawn or the beauty of an eternal sunset, knowing that the rest of the world would never, ever see it? If it was you, could you stand to know that you were one of the few to be so lucky? Knowing that so many are denied light and so many others never given the respite of the dark. What if we had no choice? What if the earth just stopped giving? What if there was nothing we could do to change her mind? No pleading, no promises, no apologies, no planting trees, no conserving energy, no cleaning polluted waters, no small gestures to show we care. Would we realize how small these gestures really are? Would we be sorry that we did not do more? What if it was too late? What if the world just couldn't take it anymore? like these don't know where to turn I admit it's a real concern should I head for clear water or just stay right here and burn Times like these Don't know where to turn When I'm lost You bring me Redemption When I'm lost You bring me Redemption down to my soul Too much pride They say it's a sin I can't hide from the fix I'm in So I just keep on running in a race that I can't win. Too much pride, they say it's a sin. When I'm lost, you bring me redemption. When I'm lost, you bring me redemption down to my soul. I 
I tried to change Now it's up to you Did some things Never meant to do And the way I've tried To make amends Isn't hard To misconstrue Tried to change Now it's up to you When I'm lost you bring me redemption Yeah, when I'm lost You bring me redemption Down to my soul Down to my soul Resilience, visiting, anxious, impatient, waiting, waiting for my husband to drive to the airport, waiting for the airplane to take off, and then the next airplane, and then the bus. Waiting, hoping it would be faster, and then the border. Everybody off, the driver called back on, and finally arriving in Vancouver. And yet, too late to see her that night. She's my friend of 50 years. College, hitchhiking in Europe, sharing dreams, and talk about the guys we fell in love with. She is the face of resilience. She who now has been reduced by 30 pounds with little hair. I finally get to see her, hold her, kiss her, massage her feet, listen to her fear and anger, listen to her sense of loss, resilience. She will not go to palliative care, not yet leave her beloved pets and her view of the ocean. Her friends, so many names I can't remember, some with faces to match, and women's groups, and stories over the years. So much of her life told in bits and pieces. Energy and love wrapped up in a little body. She created Sal Magundi the most unusual and wonderful shop in the world, first in Toronto and then in Vancouver. It was her baby and her life's possession and passion. Gone. Lee called to say she had passed. Suddenly the birds appeared at her hospital window to fly her spirit home. Birds artistically honored forever in the books created by Charles, her dear friend. Blessed birds, birds of hope. Lynn, you were so much like the birds, fluttering, momentarily quiet, and then moving, laughing, creating, soaring. Your spontaneous spirit will always be alive in me a part of who I am and who we all are. Thursday, October 13th, 7 o'clock p.m. Today was the weirdest birthday ever. No, weird doesn't even begin to describe it. It started normally. Peanut slobbered all over my journal. Peanut is her gigantic black furry dog. Um, Ninny thought it was the 4th of July and insisted I wear something patriotic, and I survived school. Then came the weirdness. Weird thing number one, a black cat followed me after school. About a block from home, it sat down in front of me and stared. 
Something was hanging from its collar, so I bent down to get a better look. It was a small envelope with my initials on it. My first thought, stupid joke from the creep Kane Thornley, it would be so like him to send me another gross dead thing. Last week he put a note in my locker with an old dried up worm inside and the note said, Princess of Darkness, you've wormed your way into my heart, <laughs> ugh. So inside the envelope was a poem and a little key. The poem read, Find the great beasts under lock and key, asleep for many an age. Among stacks on shelves, they await your eyes to release them from the page. So it seemed pretty easy to decipher the poem. Great beasts and release them from the page had to mean a book about beasts. Under lock and key, among stacks on shelves, would have to mean it was either locked up at the library or maybe at Bilbo's Books, the used bookstore down the street. But stacks on shelves sounded very library-like. So I wished Charlie wasn't homesick. Part of me was totally excited, and part of me, my left armpit, broke out into a sweat. But since my major complaint in life is that nothing ever happens to me, I took a deep breath, decided to risk getting home late, and headed to the library. Weird thing number two. When I found Miss Malkin, the librarian, I managed to blurt out something about old books in a research paper. Whenever I need to speak any, to anyone other than Ninny or Charlie, something short circuits in both my mouth and my brain seize up and go faulty. It can be quite problematic at times. Miss Malkin pursed her wrinkly lips, raised an eyebrow at me, and led me downstairs to special collections. There must have been a billion books in that room. I didn't have much time, but I had the little key. And at the back of the room, there were a bunch of dusty cabinets, so I tried the key in each one. Of course, it fit into the very last one. It's always that way in the movies, isn't it? There, all alone in its crusty glory, was a big old book. The cover read, Bestiary Massielis. Weird thing number three. Inside the book was a letter for me. I didn't have time to read it because by then my right armpit was sweating too and I didn't want to get yelled at for being late. So I put the bestiary back and ran home just in time to guess what? Get yelled at for being late. Pop is so uptight. As usual, I didn't have the courage to argue and I didn't want to upset Ninny because she was making my special 4th of July dinner. So I just clenched my teeth, set the table, and helped Ninny decipher her recipes so that dinner would be edible. And I think that's probably my amount of time. But thank you. <laughs> she had spent the late afternoon with her only grandchild on the night she died. She still had her half glasses on as she retired to bed, resting her head on the pillow as if expecting to rise again, get up as she had always done, and prepare another meal of roasted potatoes, lamb, a village salad tend once again to the family she had raised alone, a family held together by her pride and tenacity. But as her eyes closed to half-mast, she knew her life's work was complete. She had seen her children go to college and watched as each one became established in well-respected professions. She anticipated her granddaughter's departure for college by summer's end. Over the years, her children visited daily coming to her in shifts so she wouldn't be alone for long stretches of time. They took her grocery shopping or drove her to her friend's house or to a doctor's appointment. They wanted to buy her things, but she disdained flamboyant gifts and birthday presents and Mother's Day cards. She told them that the family was all that mattered to her. She was 74 and alone on this night as alone as on the day she watched her husband leave for a new beginning overseas. She lived with in-laws that ruled her, and she waited to hear from him. She rode out on a mule 10 years later from her village and started her own voyage across the ocean. She left behind her village costumes and cedar chest, expecting to return home someday. She would never see her mother again, nor her younger sister. She spent the years following and supporting her husband, just as women in her family had done for generations before. She buried her husband in the prime of his life, and in her prime, too. She took on the role of creating a world for her children once their caretaker was gone. She weaved out a tapestry, spun the threads that gave each of them an opportunity to escape the poverty she had known. She retained her core as her children grew, as they reached for status and power and comfort. 
She embraced the dress that was her mother's and grandmother's as the children absorbed a new world with its own myths and rules. She continued to move among a small circle of friends and relatives, never becoming transformed by a culture that glorified materialism and freedom. She retained her identity and affection for an ancestral village that over the years turned into an irrational reverence. Her children would come to pine for the very centeredness their mother had always known, regretting their freakish lives as they straddled two worlds. On that day in late summer, when her oldest son found her still body, her glasses resting on the pillow, he called out to her for the final time. His plaintive wail was the only sound heard. Her aged body had been stilled as she slept, bringing to an end her final years, years that had seen her become a bystander, a witness of what her family had become with her guidance. Resting peacefully in her bed, she appeared to be dreaming of a far off place with fig trees and lemons and pomegranates and the aroma of fennel flavored liqueur drifting upward toward the mountain peaks. She was back home in this dream, back to see her father and mother. She would no longer roam to worlds full of sadness and loss. Poems, stories, even intention need revision. And yet I subject glorious phrases, words saved here and there on scraps of paper to lie unseen between pages of my journals. Poems wait, always wait. Just one image could make everything come out right. Poor trapped words, always to remain lonely and static without any middlings or endings they're doomed to wait and be weighted always by another attempt, a new image. Thank you. It's called Riley. Riley, old girl, I remember the time Spin me round, then knock my glasses right onto the ground. Run for upstairs, nose inside my suitcase. Appear with my underwear wrapped round your face. straight through the fence scaring us all cause the brush is so dense going where even the deer fear to tread invite your friends over to lick at my head God must need you to showcase heaven's a great big mysterious place scatter through clouds and run clear into space how will the angels keep up with your pace my buddy my partner your race all but a run i've never prayed harder cause we've had such fun i know he's the boss and his will be done but he feels our loss and he says you're the one oh, alone in his stew don't chew on his sandals whatever you do limit your kisses to his holy face and don't drag God's tidy whities all over the place
Thank you. <laughs>